Lord and worship Him. I love that song, All Creation Worships You, because this is what the Bible tells me is true. If we don't praise Him, then creation will. The Bible says creation groans. The Bible says if we don't cry out, the rocks will. I don't know about you, but I don't want no rock taking my praise away from me. Amen? And so as long as I have breath in my lungs, I'm going to preach. And as long as I have breath in my lungs, I'm going to say amen, praise the Lord, thank God, while people are singing and testifying and preaching. And as long as my hands have strength to get above my head, I'm going to lift them up in praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you are afraid you'd get accused of being charismatic if you raised your hands above your head. But we can do it all together at one time. So you'll just do it. Raise your hands up high this morning. Amen. Boy, it's good. Amen. And don't that feel good? It just feels like a natural position of praise just to lift up hands towards heaven where he is this morning. Amen. And we serve a good God and he's worthy of our praise. I told David this week, I said, I got a lot to say this Sunday morning. I said, you better get me up early. And uh, he didn't do it. So blame it on him, all right? I'm going to preach this morning. I've studied myself full. And so I ne now I need for the Lord to preach me empty. Amen? And uh, so you're the victims. You're the victims. I am beginning a series of sermons this morning from Psalm chapter 23 called Walking with the Shepherd. Walking with the Shepherd. And I want to look this morning from verse 1. I've entitled this sermon this, The Shepherd's Position. The Shepherd's Position. The Bible uses all kinds of terms that we can identify with to make us familiar with God in His different forms of the Trinity. God the Father is visualized, I often think about in the book of Ruth. The Bible says that we can come under His wing. Gives us the idea that God is like a, a hen, a mother hen who cares for her young. God cares for us, He takes care of us. And uh, the Bible gives us these same kind of images of the Son, Jesus Christ, as we study throughout the Word of God. And I, I wrote this week, and I write a little blog, I try to write a little blog post every week, and I, I wrote this week on the Holy Spirit and how the Bible gives us these different identifiers that help us to understand who the Holy Spirit is. For instance, the Bible tells us that He is like the wind. You cannot see Him, but He's always there. Some people say, I don't know if he's there, preacher. I guarantee you, if he gets to moving in your life, you'll know he's there. Amen? Just like when a strong wind comes through, you know he's there. He's like a dove. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus like a dove. In the book of John, when he was baptized in the Jordan River. One of the pictures that the Bible gives us of our Savior is that of a shepherd. That of a shepherd. In John chapter 10 and in Psalm chapter 22, he's the good shepherd. You say, preacher, what does the good shepherd do? The Bible says in John chapter 10 that the good shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. That is Jesus Christ the shepherd involved in our justification. In Psalm chapter 23 and in Hebrews chapter 13, he is the great shepherd. You say, preacher, what does the great shepherd do? The great shepherd not only lays his life down for the sheep... But he constantly and continuously cares for the sheep. That is Christ in your sanctification. And in 1 Peter chapter 5 and Psalm chapter 24, he is the chief shepherd. You say, preacher, what does the chief shepherd do? The chief shepherd not only lays his life down for the sheep, he not only cares for the sheep throughout this life, but one day, thank God, he's coming back for the sheep that belong in his fold. Amen? That is Christ the shepherd in our justification. So if you came this morning thinking salvation was a one-time experience that never had any effect on your life after that, it just simply got you out of hell, then I must tell you this morning that your beliefs are contrary to the Word of God. But Christ desires to walk with you every step of the way. So here's what he says in Psalm chapter 23, verse 1. Can you believe you could take a verse this short and get a sermon that could last two hours? But you can. I understand what Paul said when he said to the church at Rome, when he said, Oh, the depths and the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge 
of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Brother John, you'd take a three-word verse and preach for days on it, couldn't you? The word of God is boundless. Here's what he says to us, Psalm chapter 23, verse 1, the shepherd's position. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Father, this morning, help us to preach with Holy Spirit anointing and power. Help us to speak, Lord, with clarity and with conviction from your word. Lord, we love you. We want to bring to illumination this morning the way that you care for us as our great shepherd, as laid out by the psalmist David in Psalm chapter 23. God, help us to preach this morning. Set our words on fire. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. I want you to notice two things with me from this verse. I want to split it up in half, and I want to take these two different phrases, and I want to look at them. Number one, this morning, I want to look in regard to the shepherd's position at the attributes of his position. I want to look at the attributes of his position where the psalmist David says, The Lord is my shepherd. Now, Brother John, you know this. There are no verbs in the Hebrew language. There are only nouns and subjects and predicates. And so when we actually study this word, it is a resolute statement that David says, and he simply says this, The Lord, my shepherd. Boy, if you're here this morning, you say, Preacher, I'm thankful that the Lord is my shepherd. Just say, Amen. I'm thankful that God didn't leave me to take care of myself, but He has provided for my care Himself. And so we look this morning at the attributes of his position. Notice with me three things. Number one, he is my maker. Notice number one, he is my maker. Now I want you to notice this. We're not speaking of him as our creator. We're not speaking of him as our maker in that he is our creator, though he is that. But we are speaking of him as the one who cares for us, the one who gives us provision. Perhaps you've seen somebody who felt like they were responsible for your success or the success of another. Look at someone and say, hey, don't you ever forget, I made you what you are. You are only what you are because I made you. Maybe you've heard somebody say that before. And literally, God, as our shepherd, has the right to look at us and say, Hey, it is because of me that you exist, and it is because of me that you have what you need. Literally, the shepherd looks at us as the sheep, and he says, I made you. David understood as a shepherd that it was God who had made him what he was, and it was God alone, and David understood that without God, he was nothing. Have you ever thought about this? We live in a universe that is so big, so vast, so expansive, that we could never, we could never discover it all. We don't even know how far the universe goes, and a person doesn't live long enough to travel to see everything that is in our universe. It's so big. God has created this universe that is so big. And yet you could walk out in the yard, and you could take up a pile of dirt in your hand, you could put it under a microscope, and you could find millions upon billions of organisms living in that pile of dirt. God has created this world so vast, so expansive, And yet God has created this world so small and so minute. And yet out of all that he has created, everything that he has made by the word of his power and by the work of his hand, does this not blow your mind? God desires to be your shepherd. God desires to be my shepherd. He loves you and I so much that his desire is to care for us as his shepherd. Shepherd. God is so big, so mighty, and so powerful, and so uh, so unexplainable. And the word here for the Lord, when he says, The Lord is my shepherd, is the word Yahweh. The word Yahweh. Now, let me let me explain to you something. If if a person in the ancient world would have said, God is my shepherd, then the, the people around would have said, Okay, no big deal. In the ancient world, There were many gods. People believed that there were many gods that were in existence. They believed that, you know, the Philistines, the Bible tells us, had many gods that they worshipped. The Canaanites had many gods that they worshipped. So when you just say a a, a general phrase like God, it has no ring to it. But David says, no, not God is my shepherd, but he says, Yahweh is my shepherd. Now you say, preacher, what is the significance of that? What does it matter? What's, we might say, in a name? What is it that is in a name? Well, when David said, God is my shepherd, 
People said, oh yeah, we all believe our God does different things for us. But when David said, Yahweh is my shepherd, that caused the people around him to perk up and listen a little more. You say, preacher, why is that so? Because they had heard some things about Yahweh. They had heard some things that Yahweh had done. They had heard that Yahweh provided a boat for a man named Noah and he and his family escaped a mighty flood that encompassed the whole world. They had read about how Yahweh took an entire nation of people who were in slavery under the most powerful man under the sun whose name was Pharaoh and he walked them out of that bondage through the leadership of a man by the name of Moses. They had heard that Yahweh had led his people through the wilderness and when they came to the Red Sea and they were being pursued by the army of the Egyptians that God did not lead them around another way but he literally caused the waters to part in the middle and he allowed his people to walk walk by and walk through to the other side to safety. They had heard how Yahweh had helped this man named Gideon to take the jawbone of a donkey and slay 300 men. 300 men with just the jawbone of a donkey. Boy, some of you talk so much, I bet your jawbones are that uh, uh, hard and, and callous too. Amen? Don't you think so? And so they had heard all of these things that Yahweh had done. And when David said, the Lord, Yahweh, is my shepherd, it caused them to stop and pay attention because, don't miss this, Yahweh had developed a reputation for being exactly what his people needed right when his people needed it. Oh, 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 my goodness, am I preaching to a valley of dry bones this morning? Let me just say it one more time and give you a chance to respond just a little bit better than that. They understood throughout history that God our Father, our Shepherd, had been exactly what His people needed and exactly the time that they needed it in their lives. He is a good shepherd. Now, now listen to this, listen to this, listen to this right here. I wrote this down. I was reading a book by Philip Keller. He's a great, great writer who wrote on the sheep and their shepherd. And he said this. I, I think this is so profound to me. I don't know why it is. But this phrase just stuck out to me. Here's what Philip Keller said. He said, the lot in life of any particular sheep depends on the man who owns it. Now, you're not as sophisticated as you think. And I'm not as sophisticated as I think. And when God searched the universe for an example to describe his people, he used a sheep. You know why? Well, yeah, we're like sheep, and sheep are dumb. Let me say it again. Just I don't want you to miss it. Sheep are dumb. Ever wonder why God didn't call you a cat? I got a cat. We got a little cat. I love cats. You know, I didn't have to teach him one time to use the bathroom in the right place. He just did it by himself. Just put a little lid in a box. Every time he goes right there. Dogs, you have to lay a pad out. I mean, it's just, who's got time for that? I'm trying to train a wife. I don't have time to train a dog. I'm just kidding. That was a joke. I'll pay for that one later. No, I'm just kidding. But, but, but literally, God uses the sheep to paint a picture of us. Sheep are helpless. Helpless. They can't do anything to help their own situation. They need a caretaker. When David says, the Lord is my shepherd, he's literally boasting. <laughs> he said, man, you won't believe who my shepherd is. You know why? You imagine two shepherds living side by side, their cattle on each side of the fence. One shepherd on one side takes care of his fields. He's got lush green grass, pure water for the sheep to drink. When it's time to bring the shears out and cut off the excess wool, he does it at the right time. They don't carry too much weight. They don't carry too many burdens. He's the perfect shepherd. And the man right next door to him is pathetic. His fields are brown, his water is muddy, his food is dirty. He, does, he never shears the sheep in the proper manner. He doesn't bandage their wounds, he doesn't protect them from the wolves. Those sheep might look through the fence every once in a while and say, Boy, <laughs> as dumb as they are, they could probably figure out it sure would be nice to be over there rather than over here. And you know what we do? We live in a world today 
People are under the shepherd's care of the devil and of this world. And they're sin-filled and they're sickly and they're disease-ridden. And they'd love for somebody to open the gate and let them through. They'd love for somebody to tell them, Hey, come on over to the green pastures of the good shepherd. And understand that. When I, when I read that this week, I, that, that just stuck out in my mind. I thought, the lot of, in life of any particular sheep depends on the man who owns it. Boy, bless God, it'll make you thankful you're under the Lord's care. Man, it'll make you thankful. Not only is my maker, but he's my master. He has the right to ownership of me because of his status as a shepherd. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6, the Bible says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Do you understand something that literally as a shepherd would purchase sheep from a cattle auction? Christ has bought you. The great shepherd has paid a price for you. He has purchased you, not with coins or with possessions, but with his own precious blood. He has made us his own. My dad and I, in fact, this first year, we, uh, we, we don't have a garden. But that doesn't mean he won't plant one. He's been known to plant them in July and August, so he, we still got time. Brother Duell started in March. It's not about how you get there. It's just about if you get there. Amen? But, but we, we get out there and we toll and, and we till the ground and you sweat. I want to tell you something, man. When a tomato comes off the vine that you planted, it's just something different about it. I mean, Kroger, they just are not the same. Something about the fact that you know your sweat fell into that ground. It's kind of nasty, really, when you think about it. If you thought, ever thought, you know, yours and other people's sweat actually fertilized the ground, kind of. Salt's good nutrients. You pour your own sweat in there. I've never been in a garden where you didn't get cut. And, and your blood is in that ground. And, and when, the, when the produce comes and you eat it, there's just something different about it. Because when you put your own effort, your own blood, your own sweat, your own tears into something, it means something more to you. Do you understand? When Christ was in the garden, the Bible says his sweat turned as great drops of blood. That was for you and for me. It was not that he was fearful of the punishment. It is that the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all, as Isaiah said in chapter 53, verse 6. I'm going to tell you something. He cares for you in a way that nobody else can. And when you run afoul, he'll chase after you. When you get out of the fold, he'll come and find you. When you're hungry, he'll feed you. When you're carrying burdens, he'll take them off of you. That's how... He cares for us. You say, preacher, why does he love me so? Because he's laid down his own life to purchase you. He loves you that much. Because of that, he has ownership of you. We're bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. Now here's the thing. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, what you do. Everybody is under the ownership of some master. Either you're under the mastery of this world or you're under the mastery of our Savior. And when God buys us, when He lays His life down for us, when Jesus Christ purchases us, listen to this, don't miss this, He has a right to ownership over us. We live in a world where many are like sheep under a bad owner. They're sickly, they're diseased, they're hungry, they're hurting, they're wondering, and they're dying. Many in the folds of Satan, in the folds of this world, they'd love to get out. They would love to escape. They would love to come to God's green pastures, but they don't know how. And so we as believers, we submit ourselves under the mastery, of, under the sovereignty, under the shepherding of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we understand that our shepherd's not a cruel master. He's not a tyrant. He's not an angry ruler. He doesn't take, pun he doesn't take joy in whipping us or punishing us or being cruel to us. But instead, he is totally and completely loving. You say, preacher, how do you know that? Because number one, he has chosen me. He is, I want you to think about that. He has chosen me. My parents didn't choose me. They got stuck with me. Do you understand that? They didn't have a choice. If I was ugly, dumb, weird, 
didn't matter. I was theirs. But you know what the Bible says? The Bible says he's adopted us. He's adopted us. Now when you go to an adoption shelter, you go to an orphanage, you get to scan them up and down. And I admire people who adopt children knowing the difficulties and the issues that they face and that they will deal with for the rest of their life. Isn't that admirable? And you know what Christ said to us through John's gospel? He said, you didn't choose me. I chose you. And Paul said, while we were yet sinners, not reconciled, but alienated from the life of God, enemies of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, him knowing that we would spit on him, reject him, turn our backs against him, rebel against his will, he still said, I choose you. Well, bless God, friend, he ain't chose you and then going to leave you. But he's chosen us. And he's bought us, he's called us by name, he's made us his own, and he delights. He delights in caring for you and for me. The thief, Jesus said in John 10, comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus said, I come to give life. I come to return what the devil and the world have stolen from you. Joel said, the prophet said he'd return to us the lost years that the canker worm has eaten. The devil can take from you, but as much as he's taken, God will give it back and more tenfold if you'll just put yourself under his care. He's our maker, he's our master. Then thirdly, this morning, he's my marker. I have on Saturday mornings introduced Tiffany to a whole new world of television. Sometimes we will watch The Rifleman. Say amen if you know The Rifleman. Amen. Amen. Lucas McCain, what a man. Sometimes we'll watch Gunsmoke. We really like to watch The Andy Griffith Show. I was saddened to find out that everybody that played in the Andy Griffith show isn't nothing but a bunch of Hollywood liberals. And boy, it really broke my heart. I said to myself, so you mean Mayberry wasn't even Mayberry? They did it in Hollywood. But uh, my favorite show always has been, of, of all of those TV shows, Bonanza. It's my favorite one. Love the Cartwrights. And I remember an episode where many um, rustlers, they called them in those days, were coming and stealing from the Ponderosa Ranch cattle. And the way that they identified that the cattle belonged to Mr. Cartwright was that the cattle had a mark on them. Had a mark on them. Marking a man's herd was an important part of shepherding. In fact, upon buying sheep, one of the first things that a herdsman would do would be to mark his livestock with a distinguishing mark that was easily identifiable. Everybody in the ancient world was raising livestock. Everybody had animals of different kinds, and everybody had animals of the same kind. And if one was not careful, his stock would get mixed in with the neighbor's. His possession, his jewel, his livelihood, what he had worked for, what he had toiled for, could be mistaken for someone else's. If the cattle were not appropriately marked, perhaps a greedy man might steal his possession. If the cattle were not properly marked, someone who found the possession might have trouble getting it back to its rightful owner. So a good shepherd takes the edge of his razor-sharp knife And he takes each one of his sheep and he buries it deep into their ear and gives them a distinguishing mark that identifies them with him for the rest of their days. Must be deep enough where it cannot be removed, it cannot heal over, and it can never be hidden. 
Now, this is a painful thing. It is a painful thing for the sheep to endure, but it is also very painful for the shepherd to perform. Especially the shepherd who loves his sheep. But it is necessary. And even though it is painful, it is actually, though unknown to the sheep, the most loving thing that a shepherd could do. And he would say to the sheep if he could, yes, I know it hurts you. For now. But this will identify you with me forever and ever so that no one else might be able to claim you as their own. See where I'm going here? The shepherd would take the sheep, mark them, and he would say to that sheep, you are forever mine. And did you know something this morning? Jesus, as the good shepherd, has marked us with an identifying mark that can never be removed. And it's painful. Because in order for him to mark you, he's got to get rid of some things, some dearly held, some closely held things that you might not want to let go of. But know that even though it's painful in the interim, it's healthy for you in the long run. That mark identifies us with him forever and ever and ever. You say, preacher, oh, what a, what a sweet thing to think about. Yes, but do you know what the mark is? Do you know what the mark of Christ is? The Bible says he told him in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, if any man wants to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up what, preacher? Take up green pastures? Take up still waters? Take up comfort and convenience? Take up the heavy and the burdensome cross and follow me. That's his mark. And understand something, and I'm going to move on. It, it is not about me saying, he is my shepherd. It is about me living in the position of the sheep. Under his lordship, under his ownership, under his sovereignty. That's the attributes of his position. Secondly, and I'll be done very quickly, notice with me the amenities of his position. Paul said in verse, excuse me, David said in Psalm chapter 23, verse 1, he said, the Lord is my shepherd, and he said, I shall not want. Literally, it reads this way, I will never be deprived of what I need. There are two things that I want you to notice about this. Number one, this morning, there's the idea of care. David said that the Lord was a shepherd, and because of this fact, David did not have any needs. David wrote later in Psalm chapter 34, verse 9, he said, O oh, fear the Lord, his saints, there is no want to those who fear them. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. There's a formula here that we can identify from David's words. And the formula is this, when Christ is my shepherd, you see, these are not two different phrases that are to be separately identified. No, they work together. David literally says this, when Christ is my shepherd, I'll never lack anything that I need. But if I start wandering outside of the fold and in the world and away from the care of the shepherd, then there are times when I will find myself without not only what I want, but also without what I need. God's made it very simple for us. He said, you just stay put and I'll take care of you. But we wonder. Come thou fount of every blessing, the old hymn said in the second verse, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the one I love. We are prone to wonder. The Hebrew word used here, want, speaks of being devoid of something or being deprived of something. David literally said, as long as the Lord is my shepherd, I'll never be deprived or devoid of what I need. 
Psalm chapter 84, verse 11, David said, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory, and no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, Paul told the church at Philippi, he said, My God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory of Christ Jesus. We have tried, Tiffany, I, this week to start, I, I preached on this sec, several weeks ago, and I, I try to be good and practice what I preach, and I preached several weeks ago about transforming our mind through the memorization of Scripture. And so this week, every day, our Bible app gives us a verse, the same verse, and we try to memorize it. One of the verses this week was Psalm chapter 37, verse 4, where the, the psalmist said, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. That's not a health and wealth promise. That's a Scripture right out of the Word of God. Love Him, delight yourself in Him, enjoy His company, enjoy His pastures, enjoy His care, and everything you need will be given for you free of charge. Care. The phrase, shall not want, it it reflects, one commentary I was reading said it reflects both past experience and future confidence. David said, I've never wanted, I'm not wanting, and I never will want as long as I stay in His care. Genesis chapter 48, verse 15. Jacob was speaking to his sons, and the Bible says he blessed Joseph, and he said this to him, to his son. He was imparting some final wisdom before he left. And he said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked. Listen to this. The God who has fed me all my life, long to this day. Well, Jacob was an old man. And he said, the God of my fathers who's fed me all the days of my life. David said it this way, I was young, now I'm old. David might have said, boy, I've seen a lot of things. I've seen kids turn on their parents. I've seen friend turn against friend. But i tell you one thing I've never seen. Never seen the righteous forsaken, nor the descendants of the Lord begging for bread. Now, We have to exercise some spiritual maturity when we read this statement. It is not that he gives us everything that we want. But rather it is that we find everything that we need in him. He's all sufficient. I will say that again. It's not that he gives us everything that we want. But it is that we find everything we need in him. We must understand what David's words are properly. Because see, when when you read through the Word of God, you you find all these different stories. I wrote some of them down. I I, I remember that in Genesis, Joseph was buried alive by his brothers. I remember that when David... I've been teaching through 1 Samuel. I remember that when David was on the run from Saul, he was a homeless man with no friends. I remember that Elijah was so hungry that he had to be fed by a raven. I remember that Daniel was enslaved in the... Ownership of the Babylonians. I remember that Paul was imprisoned as he wrote several of the letters in the New Testament. And I remember that John was banished and exiled away from his home and to a foreign land of Patmos. So when I read the Word of God, I understand that just because I'm in His care doesn't mean that I avoid all the troubles and trials of this life. God never said we would avoid all the troubles and trials in this life, but we know that whatever we go through, we can grow through, and that we know whatever we go through, we are constantly under His expert care. Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 33, speaking to the disciples, He said, listen, I've spoken to you these things that in me you have, may have peace because you're not going to get it in this world. He said, let me tell you what you're going to get in this world. In this world, you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. And so he says, doesn't mean that you'll never go through anything. But it means that as you go through it, I'll be there to give you what you need. You see, as Christians, we need not be afraid of the fight because we're in a fight. We just need to make sure we got what we need to fight. We just need to make sure we're prepared for the battle in which we stand. And he has promised to care for us. Then secondly this morning, and I'll be done, there's a second idea 
that we get from the phrase, I shall not want. And it's not only the idea of care, but it's the idea of contentment. Contentment with the shepherd. You say, preacher, what does that mean? It means this, not desiring or craving anything else other than the care of the shepherd. To be content in the Lord means that you're not constantly desiring something else or somewhere else. Isaiah said in 53, we all like sheep have gone astray, but unfortunately some of us keep going astray. We're constantly wondering, we're constantly looking for other fields, for greener pastures. What is it they say? The grass is not always greener on the other side. We're constantly wondering, looking for a hole in the fence, constantly looking how we can escape from the fold and live in the freedom that the world promises. Oh, if I could just get out of this fence and, and get out there where there's freedom and liberty, liberty and liberation and I can do what I want to. I don't have to be bound down by the rules and the regulations and the laws of Christianity. If I could just get to where there's freedom to be who I want to be. You want freedom? You want liberty? Paul said, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. What is there in the world, preacher? There's a promise of things that can never be delivered. There's a promise of goods that never come through. There's a promise of freedom, but really all there is is desolation, sickness, sorrow, pain. Said this morning in Sunday school, you watch the news, is there anything positive? And you say, preacher, are there no positive things going on? Sure, there are positive things going on. But that's not what we want to hear. That's not what we feed off of. The world today feeds off a of conflict, argument, anger, evil. I was looking back over my old tweets. Y'all know what Twitter is? Some of you do. I, I just scrolled down to the bottom. Somebody sent me a picture of something I tweeted a long time ago. And I said to myself, I wonder what stupid things I tweeted a long time ago. And I found one. I hope this don't offend some of you, but I just think it's true. And I'll love you through it. But I tweeted this back in 2014. I said, if you want to know how the culture of America has changed... In 1970, Billy Graham was America's pastor. And in 2014, Joel Osteen is America's pastor. And that right there is a microcosm of where our world is at today. We've traded the truth of God's word for a lie. The world has caused us to believe that all God wants to do is keep us from things. But what God really wants to do is to allow us to experience things that we could never experience unless we're under his expert care. I, I remember reading many years ago about a sheep who had been missing for five years. It was a fascinating sheep. I remember they found her in South Africa and they said she had over 25 pounds of wool on her that they sheared off when they finally caught her. And you know, it got me to thinking, you know, when, when you get out of the fold of the Lord Jesus Christ, you wander away, and, uh, and, and that, um, that wool keeps growing. It keeps growing, keeps growing, keeps growing, keeps growing. And you know what, Brother Billy, before long, if there's nobody there to cut it off, it'll absolutely weigh you down. And you know what the message that, that we've got to get to people today? And the message that probably some of you need to hear today is this. When you exit the fold of God, your problems don't stop. You're still going to get hungry. You're still going to get sick and need somebody to care for you. You're still going to get thirsty. And your wool's still going to keep growing. The burdens are still going to mount up in your life. All of that's going to remain the same. You know the only thing that's going to change? is Now you don't have anybody to take care of it for you. Now you've got to take care of it by yourself. Still got the same debt, same paycheck, same family, same situation. But you got no God. It's the only difference. 
Why would we exit his care? He has moved heaven and earth to purchase us. The Bible says he's still moving heaven and earth to give us everything that we need. And I wrote this reference verse down and then I'll be done. This verse fascinates me. And I've read this verse many, many times before. I've read the 8th chapter of Romans so many times I can't even think. But I don't know why when I read this verse this week that it just so stuck in my mind. Romans chapter 8 verse 32. (laughs) He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? You know know what Paul said? Paul said, man, he's, he's given you his son. What greater gift can he give? He's given his own flesh and blood. Everything else is just icing on top of the cake. He said he's he's given you a son to secure your redemption. And how much more will he not give you all things freely? God does not just delight in saving you. But God delights in keeping you. And if you and I, stubborn sheep, could just learn how to be content in his pastures and yield ourselves to his authority as our shepherd. Oh, how wonderful it would be to be an obedient sheep in the fold of our great shepherd. The Lord, my shepherd. I don't have anything that I need. Everything that I need is found in him. What a shepherd. Father, we love you and we thank you for your word. God, I thank you, Lord, that such a a small verse with just a few words, has such significant meaning to us as sheep in your pasture. Lord, I thank you this morning that you have not only called us, you've not only purchased us, but you're keeping us and you're making us your own. Thank you for being our shepherd. Thank you for giving us everything that we need. Help us not to wonder. There's someone here this morning who's wandering out of the fold. I pray that you would find them. Bring them back. Safely. Father, I pray this morning if there's someone in this place who has never been purchased by your blood, never been bought with a price. I pray this morning, God, if there's someone here who does not know you as their Lord and Savior, that they've never been saved, that today they would come forward and enter into a relationship with you whereby they'll never be the same. Use this time of invitation for your honor and your glory. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.